Uh, today we will talk about neuronal networks. So you heard a lot of uh, things about signal transduction, signaling in the cell, between cells, about how neurons would react on the certain things. Now we want to have a look into networks, into how networks look like, how they can be arranged, and how they could work. So the topics today will be integrating information within a network, modulating and controlling such networks. We will discuss about two types of networks as uh, examples. One will be basically the hippocampal network, what's uh, its function, what's its dysfunction, how does it look like, and uh, we will have a similar thing in uh, the integrative network which controls sleep and arousal. So if we, if we look on networks, we can have a very simplified scheme of such nervous system functions. Yeah? And if we look <coughs> on these schemes, some rough idea about how that could be was around already in the 17th century when you uh, look on René Descartes' description how basically the signaling from the food which is too close to fire goes to the brain and would lead to the reaction to retract that food. In a more modern view, it would look like on left hand. So what we have is on the skin we get the perception, the perception of heat, of touch whatsoever. This would basically be sent to the spinal cord, to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, where we have sensory neurons. From there, it would go to the brain. And within the brain, we have sensory regions, which then signal to motor regions. And these motor regions would then send the information to the spinal cord, Again, where we have motor neurons, this time in the ventral horn, so in a different location. And this would innervate muscles and would induce muscle contraction. So basically, there is a circuitry from the sensation of an environmental factor <coughs> through the spinal cord to the brain some networking in the brain which leads to the reaction of motor neurons uh, and the muscle. So as a scheme, we can say we see the input, so we see the fire burning, and we see the output. This is the retraction of the food. And with certain description mapping, we see some parts of this hidden process here. At least we can have an idea who contributes to this hidden stuff. And we have seen sensory neurons in the spinal cord, sensory neurons in the cortex, motor neurons in the cortex, and motor neurons in the spinal cord. So that's the easy part. This hidden integrating part here is of course much more complex. More looks like this. So basically if we get some input from the cortex or to the cortex, the sensory cortex basically can deliver information into the system which regulates motor control. Yeah? It's called basal ganglia. And this is basically a feedback, feed-forward loop, uh, mostly inhibitory, and it's localized in the older brain regions, so it's something which is uh, developmentally and evolutionary stable over long periods. We find such systems in mammals throughout. And uh, it's integrating the information which the brain gets not only from the sensory neurons but also from other structures <coughs> and uh, 
integrates the whole thing in an uh, appropriate motor response. It's not only in the reaction to, to hot fire, it's involved in every day's movement and the fine control of, of all our movements in walking and so on. So what, what we have is basically the cortex signaling to the striatum and you see this in a part is in an anatomical layout and this is more the schematic layout. So we get stimulatory influence on the striatum. The striatum, if stimulated, sends inhibitory signals either through the indirect pathway or uh, through the direct pathway to basically the internal globus pallidus which then can signal to the thalamus. And if you look on these things, we have uh, involvement of a structure which is called substantia nigra, uh, which also can influence the thalamus, and we have influence through a structure which is called subthalamic nucleus. So we have a number of structures involved, and if you look on the scheme, you will see that most of this uh, signaling is inhibitory or red. Yeah? Only a few of them are green. What you have to consider is the consequence in the network. So if I have an inhibitory signal, then it would dampen the next cell. Whether the effect on the network now is dampening of the network or excitation of the network depends very much on the type the next cell is. Because if I inhibit an excitatory neuron, then the signaling will be less. If I inhibit an inhibitory neuron, then the inhibition on the network will be reduced and the signaling will be increased. And this is basically the game which goes on in such networks and especially also here in the basal ganglia. And if something goes wrong in this fine-tuning system, then uh, we lose control of our motors, and that's things which happen in Parkinson's disease, where the signaling from the substantia nigra to the striatum doesn't work properly anymore. And through this, we lose the fine-tuning of our movement. So this is, this is just one example and of course this sample uh, shows us that uh, modulation within this network is crucial to get uh, the output we need. Now this connectivity is not stable, it's not fixed. And you see the Plasticity the, in the brain, especially in the cortical regions, is very high. So while some structures seem to be fairly hardwired, others are very dynamic. And we see plasticity on two uh, levels. Basically, one is plasticity within a single synapse. So the signal transmission, the signal intensity of transmission within a single synapse can be modulated, and we see extrasynaptic plasticity. So plasticity in the network, which basically goes on the uh, formation of new synapses or the retraction of synapses. And this plasticity is crucial, because without this plasticity, we would not be able to adopt the brain function to new needs. There would be no learning without all these uh, adaptations. <coughs> and uh, we would be basically hardwired without these adaptations. So let's have a look in synaptic plasticity. And there is one uh, very crucial thing which, which happens in the brain in certain brain areas, and this is called potentiation. And uh, what we see is if we look on a neuron, on the 
electrical response of a neuron to a constant stimulus. It would be always roughly the same. That's what we call baseline. If we then stimulate the same neuron in a high frequency way, so basically the neuron is exposed to a situation that it's heavily activated over a certain time. So basically there's a lot of demand on this neuron. Then the reaction of the neuron to a single stimulus, which is still on the same intensity level, will increase. Yeah? And that's what's called post-titanic potentiation. This is a process which lasts not very long. Yeah? It degrades very fast. But then we reach a level in certain axons, in certain synapses, which gives us an increased response over a long time. That can be minutes, that can be hours, that can be even days. And this is what's called long-term potentiation. This long-term potentiation is a crucial process <coughs> in modulating the network. This long-term potentiation, um, in the end, uh, helps to emphasize which of the synapses is important and a lot in use. And lack of use can produce the inverse effect. So if we look on such a synapse, so baseline would be a normally functioning synapse. So if we now give a burst and stimulate the synapse strongly, we can have what's called early LTP. So this is an effect uh, which is important also for this post-titanic mm, potentiation. This is modification of what's existing in the synapse in a way to facilitate the function of the synapse. <clears throat> this can be uh, phosphorylation of glutamate receptors of the AMPA type, uh, transport of glutamate receptors which sit in internal stores to the plasma membrane, uh, and such things. This is not very long lasting, so if there is no further stimulation coming, this can be reversed very fast. If we get prolonged stimulation and longer stimulation, what we get is a late long-term potentiation. And what we get here is new components integrated, new proteins synthesized, transport to the synapses, integrated into the synapse. For this, we need protein synthesis. And this is basically uh, a more stable and more long-lasting effect. On the other hand, if we do not use this synapse, then it can be down-regulated. Parts of the synapse can be moved to other synapses which are more heavily used. Yeah, and what we end up in this state would be what's called long-term depression. And if it goes on, it even can go to silencing of synapses and retraction of synapses. So, uh, but on the synapse level, it can basically silence this. And this is a process which, which is as important as long-term potentiation in terms of learning. Because if you start from a baseline condition, and let's theoretically say all the neurons are on baseline, and the only way to modulate the network would be to increase signaling through these synapses on some state in your life you would end up with all synapses running full pace and that would be a level where there's no differences in signaling through the single synapse so basically you are back to baseline state just spending more energy 
and you could not differentiate basically between those two states. It's just tabula rasa again. So you basically would run into problems if you would not have a mechanism where you can take back. So you can down modulate the function of some of these. And this is crucial to keep a limited network under control. So as we said, the brain does not necessarily grow very much after uh, it's reached its final size. There's neurons do not really divide there. Some few neurons, precursors, which can integrate. And uh, <coughs> one of these areas where we have these progenitor cells is the hippocampus, which we will come on in a few moments. So this is synaptic plasticity. What's extrasynaptic plasticity? Well, extrasynaptic plasticity is basically what happens once we reach this state or this state. So it's the translation of the potentiation and or depression in synaptic connectivity. So if we have the original situation like this, yeah, we have a uh, dendrite which is contacted by a blue and an orange axon, but there is no contact with the red axon. If we now have a new experience, if we learn a new task, if we learn a new language, whatever, uh, then it might happen that we learn that connection from the yellow dendrite to the red axon might be important. Yeah, this is the formation of new synaptic connectivity during the process of long-term potentiation, of late long-term potentiation. If we keep on learning, if we repeat this task, this synapse might be strengthened. At the same time, another synapse might be not used anymore, less used, and it can actually retract. If we stop training, yeah, the strengthening of this synapse might be removed. Yeah, it's still there, but it might be less strong, the signaling. If we start to train again, if we start to go through the experience again, this formation step here is already done and all what we have to do is to strengthen this again. So basically once we learn something, if we don't train it, it might weaken. But we can come back to that much faster than if we learn something new. And that's an experience each of us had in, in, in their life. One of the structures with the strongest plasticity and where really a lot of learning goes on is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a cortical structure, archicortical structure, and the name comes from the Latin word of the seahorse, which is hippocampus, and if you look on the human hippocampus, isolated from the brain, and a seahorse, there is a certain similarity. And old anatomists liked to describe structures to something which was already known. <coughs> this hippocampus is a highly integrated network. Again, a long time ago, more than 100 years ago, through microscopy, it was clear that uh, the hippocampus consists of a number of principal cells and a number of non-principal cells. Principal cells we find in the dentate gyrus, the granule cells which form a dense layer, and we have pyramidal cells in the hippocampus proper. So we have three types of pyramidal cells here, CA3, CA2 is a small area down here, and CA1. And this hippocampal tree synaptic circuitry, basically, is integrated in a network 
with some cortical regions called the entorhinal cortex. Basically, the circuitry runs in a way that we have signaling from the entorhinal cortex called perforant pass, because this pass finds its way through other structures, to the dentate gyrus. The dentate gyrus granule cells send their axons, which are called mossy fibers, due to the fact that they look mossy because they form a lot of spines, to CA3. CA3 sends their axons called shuffle collaterals to CA1. And from there, we have an innervation of the subiculum and the entorhinal cortex. So again, it's a circuitry. <coughs> and this circuitry uh, underlies a lot of modulation. So we have uh, a number of information coming together in the hippocampus. And uh, the hippocampus is part of the limbic system, so it underlies uh, also the stress situation, emotional control, and so on. The interesting thing here is <coughs> that this is a very, very dynamic thing, and uh, it's a very important thing for us in finding our place in a spatial orientation. So the dorsal hippocampus is very crucial for spatial learning and memory, for mm, memorizing places where things happened and so on. The imp importance of the hippocampus for such spatial memory comes from a very special feature the hippocampus has. It has so-called place cells and grid cells. So in the pyramidal cells of CA1 mainly, we find cells which are specially active whenever we are in a certain place in a room. So if this is a room and the black line is basically the track we move, then single cells always fire when we pass the same place but they are silent when we go somewhere else. So this is called place cells. And these place cells, they can change. If we do some learning in a room, if we learn, let's say that, there would be some, some reward in this corner. Then the firing of these cells can change and they would be more active in the corner with the reward. So basically, this would turn from a place cell into a target cell. And this is a learning process. In spatial orientation, of course, if we would have a space cell for each place, it would be very, very cell-consuming to basically allocate a single cell to each location. For 1,000 locations, I would need 1,000 cells. But we do not have unlimited space in our hippocampus. There comes a second class of cell, and this is the grid cells. And these grid cells, they do not fire in a single place, they fire in a grid type space. So if we move around our, our room, these cells fire always in a certain distance from one place to the other. So basically, whenever we go this distance, the cell fires. So what we, what we see is not a single place in the room where it fires, what we see is a grid like this. And the interesting thing is that this grid type, the, the distance between the firings, yeah, the grid size is different for different cells. So if we now have cells which define a fine grid and we have cells which define a larger grid and so on, 
together with the place cell, then I can define, okay, I am now in this position because only in this position I get the firing of the grid cell number one in high frequency and grid cell number two is completely absent, but grid cell number three is firing on a moderate level. <coughs> you can compare this to a certain way with what we do in calculations. So we do not have a sim symbol for each number. We basically have 10 symbols. But these 10 symbols we use in different ways. We use for the numbers from 0 to 9. We use the same symbols for the numbers from 10 to uh, 90. We use the same type of symbols from 100 to 900. But how we mix them gives us a huge variety. So basically, with just three digits, we can produce everything from 0 to 999. So instead of having 1,000 symbols, we just need three, which of course is a huge reduction. <coughs> and for this, it's important that the cells communicate and that basically the network sees who is active, who is silent. And what we see if we compare different types of neurons, we see that some of them are highly synchronized and some of them are desynchronized. And to keep this network stable and to control this network, of course it's not sufficient to have principal cells which connect one to each other, which uh, basically uh, connect over a wide range. What we need is additional cells, cells which are independent, and that's what's called interneurons. So basically what you see in green here is non-principal neurons. They are, in this case, GABAergic, so inhibitory. And they can control the activity of, of, of the glutamatergic neurons in the hippocampus. They can take very strong influence. And originally the idea was, yes, this is GABAergic interneurons and they control certain things. And it was considered of there is some type of basket cells and some type of these cells. Now we are on at least 20 different types of such interneurons with different orientation, different function, different innervation, and we still keep counting. So these interneurons are very, very different in their types of uh, molecular markers, in types of what they innervate. So we have interneurons which might directly interact with the principal cells. There are interneurons which regulate interneurons. <coughs> and what we see is if we look on the synchronicity pattern of some of these interneurons with principal cells and interneurons with interneurons, you see that some of these fire exactly the same rhythm. So there is a certain pace which is followed by certain cells. And this pace might be given by, by either interneurons or other neurons. We don't know exactly where the pace comes from. But what we know is that the pace is there. And some of the neurons, they are basically phase shifted to the pace. So they are not synchronous, but they have the same frequency, but the phase shift. And some have a phase shift which is really leading them to firing only when others are silent. And of course, this makes a lot of sense in terms of interneurons. If you have an interneuron which is inhibitory, if this fires, then the target neuron might be silent during this phase and only be allowed to fire once the interneuron is silent. So this gives us a clear structure. It gives us a very detailed view on 
regulation. And we can regulate single parts of the hippocampus. And these interneurons can collect information from the entire brain or a large variety of the brain structures. So it's not only this influence coming directly onto the principal neurons. It's a lot of uh, information collected also through these interneurons. <coughs> now, as we look on a very dynamic structure and on a very important structure in learning here, we can interfere with these things. Yeah? And we can see uh, in the hippocampus how uh, learning takes place on a certain level or how learning uh, is really involved in network changes, how long-term uh, learning needs protein synthesis. So if, if you do some learning, then you might see uh, if you block the formation of proteins afterwards, that this learning cannot be uh, really fixed. Yeah? There is no manifestation of, of this learning or no stabilization of the learning. Yeah? It's called consolidation, the process. So if you block the protein synthesis after the learning, it will not be consolidated. So we, we cannot stabilize it. The hippocampus as an important structure for learning was identified basically through damage of the hippocampus. It's a very important learning principle in a number of sciences, and especially also in, in neuroscience, is that we learn a lot about the function of structures when they are disturbed or if they are destroyed. <coughs> and one of the uh, critical moments in, in brain knowledge was uh, a person who is famous under the name Patient H.M. Patient H.M., as a boy, had a brain injury, which caused temporal lobe seizures, temporal lobe epilepsy, which was known to originate from the hippocampus. And the surgeon, at that time, they were not as shy as uh, today. He decided to cut out the hippocampus, and because uh, he wanted to make sure, he cut out both hippocampi which led to severe anterograde amnesia. So basically, patient HM could not remember things he just saw. He could not learn new things anymore. So every day when the psychologists came to test him and to interview him, it was new for him. So it never got boring for him. <clears throat> On the other hand, he could learn skills like motor skills, which depend on other things. <clears throat> so he was asked to go for a experiment which is consisting of a star which is formed from two lines. And your task is to draw with a pencil this star following the two lines, but never passing over these two lines. And the tricky thing is you see your hand and your star through a mirror. So basically, when you have to draw to the right, you actually see your hand going to the left. And you have to compensate for that. It's a task you can learn, and you will manage to learn if you're a normal person, uh, and you can follow the star quite easily. AGM was able to learn it. Yeah, so this basically goes through different structures. And the interesting thing was he was exposed to this experiment several times. And one day he came up with the command, I thought that's much more difficult. Yeah? So he could not remember that he did it 20 times, but he learned the skill. <clears throat> so the hippocampus is very important in learning such things. It's also integrating new synapses, it's developing new synapses. There is uh, a nice study from the last millennium uh, when 
It's called the London Taxi Driver Study. Basically, taxi drivers were subjected uh, to uh, imaging of the brain at the beginning of their career and after certain years of experience being a taxi driver in London. And being a taxi driver in London basically is massive spatial learning. You learn all the streets in London, you learn how you can fastest go from here to there at which time. And over a period of several years, the hippocampus of these persons grew on average by something like 10%. So basically you really see the learning and the memory in the volume of the hippocampus in this study. So this is an extreme example, but you see there is really new formation of synapses and uh, the hippocampus is one of these areas where we also have newly formed neurons which can be integrated also in the adult brain. So this is an extremely uh, flexible system. And it's an extremely dynamic system and that makes it also extremely vulnerable. So disturbances <clears throat> in some of the cell populations can easily happen if you have brain trauma damage. Yeah? And this can induce diseases like epilepsy. So we have in a hippocampus a very high number of epilepsies which originate from brain traumata. 70% of the, the brain traumata induced epilepsies occur in the hippocampus. And if we lose now some of these regulatory cells and some of these regulatory things, what easily happens is that a normal EEG, like it would look here, turns into something like this. So basically, <clears throat> this well-organized chaos in the hippocampus goes into something which is a synchronous firing of certain groups. And synchronous firing of certain cells produces uh, strong field potentials, which can influence other neurons and can induce firing of other neurons. And this is how such what we call seizure can spread. So the system is very dynamic because we need it for learning and survival. On the other hand, it's also uh, very vulnerable. And once something goes wrong, this can basically take the entire brain out of control. So the seizure might start in its focus, but it can spread secondarily to other seizures, to other regions. <coughs> so this is if something goes wrong. So let's switch to the other system which I wanted to introduce you. <coughs> it's not so much a single nucleus, a single brain region, in this case, it's a number of brain regions working together to produce an effect. And this is the control of sleep and arousal. <coughs> so the arousal system consists of a number of brain nuclei, which are usually also uh, in the older structures of the brain, because sleep and arousal is something which affects uh, a number of animals, not only humans. And we have basically two independent, but still collaborative structures. One is the cholinergic nuclei here in the lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus and in the pedunculopontine petun nucleus, which directly signal to the thalamus. And the thalamus sends information to the hippocampus about uh, and, and controlling the activity of uh, cortical neurons, of cortical pyramidal cells. The other structures work together here in red. It's the locus ceruleus, which is noradrenergic. Then we have the dorsal rafa, which is serotonergic. We have the ventral periaqueductal gray, which is dopaminergic. We have the tuberomamillary nucleus, which is histaminergic. Yeah, <clears throat> we have the basal forebrain where we have acetylcholine and GABA as neurotransmitters, 
and we have the lateral hypothalamus where we have orexin and others. So you see we have a huge collection of different neurotransmitters acting on that. We have a huge number or broad number of brain nuclei acting together and all of them basically signal direct to the cortex and activate cortical functions so we are aroused, we are awake. And some of these things are maybe of everyday interest for those who suffer from allergies and take antihistaminic drugs to reduce the symptoms of allergies, they might feel tired from those drugs. Which is not surprising if you look here and you see that one part of our arousal system is histaminergic. So we need the histamine as a neurotransmitter to keep us awake. So if we take a drug which blocks the signaling, it's not surprising that we're tired from that. <clears throat> this arousal system is counteracted. It's counteracted by the sleep system. The sleep system is much simpler in its layout. The sleep system more or less originates from the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus and it's a GABAergic signaling, so it's an inhibitory signaling and it affects basically all the arousal nuclei in an inhibitory way. And this is, this is a switch off button. So if you basically inhibit all the arousal system, you go to sleep. <clears throat> On the other hand, what you have here, it's, it's not a very stable thing. So once you have a little bit signaling of that, then you would be aroused, then you would sleep, you would be aroused. What we know is that being awake or falling asleep is a much more stable switch. And we know it's not some diffuse thing which takes a bit and then either you fall asleep or you're awake. There's not much in between. And once you sleep and you have no sleep disturbances, you will be stably fallen asleep. And this is due to the fact that we have orexin here in this nucleus. And this orexin basically stabilizes. Yeah? So if we look on this scheme here, we see when the locus ceruleus, uh, Rafa and the other arousal systems are stable or on, then they can block the GABAergic system in the ventrolateral preoptic area and the orexin will help to stabilize that. It comes from the <coughs> lateral hypothalamic areas, uh, periphonical regions, and so we are stably awake. If, the, if we fall asleep, the GABAergic system takes over, then this GABAergic system not only switches off those regions, uh, of the arousal system, but it also blocks the orexin neurons. So basically it takes away this part as well. And thereby the switch is much more efficient. And it takes much more to switch back from sleep to arousal. If we have a disturbance in this, then we have a sleeping disorder. If we have disturbances in these structures, in the arousal system, or in the sleeping system, then uh, you might have something like uh, extended sleep. There was a, a virus around in the early 20th century which uh, destroyed obviously some of the arousal part or, or inhibited some of the arousal parts and people slept 20 hours a day until they recovered. Some were overexcited and if we have a disturbance in the orexin pathway, in the orexin signaling. This is what 
call what we know as uh, narcolepsia. So basically, uh, the stabilizing switch is, is, is not active and patients switch from one state to the other very rapidly and unexpectedly. So especially when you are highly excited, yeah, when kids are highly excited, then the narcolepsia kicks in. So basically, whenever you're really happy playing, then you fall asleep. Yeah? And then you come back and you can play on very fast again. But of course, this disrupted sleep hinders you from having a normal sleep profile. Yeah? You have no healthy sleep with, with REM and non-REM sleep and so on. And uh, that makes it, of course, difficult for the patients. So I hope with these two examples, I could give you a little bit of an idea how neuronal networks could be made of, how the brain could interact with different types of, of cells and how it can be modulated. And thank you for your attention.